Thanks. Well, uh, thanks a lot for having me out. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here. Um, and so, uh, like Carmen said, my name is Joe Pickerel. I'm at the New York Genome Center uh, down the street, I guess. Um, and I'm going to be talking about the detection and interpretation of uh, genetic variants that influence human traits. Um, and so, uh, I've been told to expect to be interrupted a lot, so please, uh, please do. Um, and so, what do I mean by that? Um, what, what, uh, what I'm sort of interested in, in at a basic level is uh, variation between, uh, within and between human populations. And so what I'm showing you here on this slide uh, is uh, a map of, of Europe, obviously. Uh, and in, in blue here, uh, I'm showing the percentage of people that have uh, blue eyes. And so here's, here's a blue eye, a uh, nice, large, creepy, uh, and a brown eye um, <coughs> staring at you. Um, and and so what you can see from this map, and so here's the percentage of people living in this part of, the, of Europe that have blue eyes. And so the really light blue is 80% of more, 80% or more, rather. And the, and the dark brown is 1 to one to 20%. And so what you can see is that blue eyes uh, are essentially at really high frequency in northern Europe, uh, and there's this decline of decreasing frequency. And outside of Europe, uh, they're essentially uh, absent. And so that's an example of variation within a population, so some people in a population have blue eyes, some people don't. There's also extensive variation between human populations. Uh, so what I'm showing you here is a map uh, of the world, and I'm showing you the mean male height in select populations. And so uh, here are the Biaka in Central Africa, which have, who have a mean male height of 153 centimeters, the Mbuti, 144 centimeters. This is around 4.8 for the uh, Americans. And the uh, color in the crowd, uh, uh, on the map here is showing you the mean rainfall in parts of the world, and you, you'll notice this weird correlation that uh, populations where the mean male height is short tend to live in uh, parts of the world where the mean rainfall is high for whatever reason. Um, and so that's an example of variation between human populations. Um, <coughs> and, and we know that genetic variation is, is pervasive. So we have, there's the genetic variation within populations, between populations, in everything that we are potentially interested in. So susceptibility to different pathogens. Some people are more or less resistant uh, to infection with different pathogens. Uh, anthropometric traits, height, uh, BMI, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, disease risk, essentially any imaginable phenotype, there's genetic variation that influences that phenotype. Uh, and so uh, one of the questions I'm interested in, or the major question I'm interested in, is why. So why does uh, genetic variation exist? Uh, and so there's a couple answers, potential answers to that question. And one is an evolutionary question, uh, evolutionary answer, rather. Uh, so and I'd like to motivate this by looking at a particular example. So this is the uh, frequency of the Duffy Null blood group uh, across the world. Uh, in red uh, so the, uh, is, is where this blood group is at nearly 100% frequency. Um, and so the decreasing shades of red down to uh, white, where it's 0% uh, frequency. Um, and so as you can see, the Duffy Null blood group is essentially 100% frequency in parts of <coughs> sub-Saharan Africa and is absent in the rest of the world. And so why is that? Um, one is an evolutionary answer. This Duffy protein is used by Plasmodium vivax, a malaria parasite to enter the cell, and it can't enter Duffy Null cells. And so part of the answer is that the selection pressure imposed by malaria contributes to the, the geographic distribution. So uh, in places where Plasmodium vivax was, or since it's no longer in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, that's what has driven uh, this blood group up to uh, a high frequency. But that's not a totally satisfying answer. Uh, another answer is molecular. So why does this, why is, does Duffy null exist? And the molecular answer is that there's genetic, a genetic variant in the promoter of the gene that abolishes the expression of the gene. Uh, so no protein is made, no antigen is put on the surface of the red blood cells, and that's why there's no, uh, that's what Duffinol is. Yep. Uh, yeah, and so I guess you could take, this is the actual frequency of the null blood group. If you're heterozygous, you, you're not, mm, it's like, like A, B, O type thing. So it would be like the equivalent of O. Um, so if you have one B allele and one O allele, you're B. You have the B blood group. This is the frequency of the uh, blood group. Uh, and so there are 
people, so if it's a, at 100% frequency, 100% of the people are, uh, have, have both copies knocked out in that sense. Uh, but elsewhere in the world, yeah, there'll be heterozygotes who, who do not, who are, so, but that's not included here. This is, Duff, this is the people who are Duffy null at the phenotype level. So are, have two copies of the null allele. <coughs> and so uh, this is, this is a, a really interesting example, but uh, we want to move beyond uh, individual examples and we have potentially massive amounts of data. Um, and so uh, I'm going to tell you about, uh, oh, actually, in this slide. Uh, and so I'm going to tell you um, entirely today about the second class of questions here, which is the uh, molecular, the molecular genetics. Um, I'm not going to talk about the evolutionary genetics at all. Thanks. Um, and so how does genetic variation influence traits? Um, this is sort of a, a just sort of toy model. We imagine we have a genetic variant here in A and the C, and this genetic variant influences some sort of cellular phenotype like RNA expression, uh, which in turn influences some sort of tissue phenotype like bone growth or something along those lines, which in turn influences an organismal level phenotype like height. And so the genetic variant influences something in a cell, which influences something in the tissue, which influences something in the organism, and that's why we have all this variation at a molecular level today. Um, and so how can we detect these and sort of put together uh, this sort of path? So I'm going to tell you about two projects. One is sort of an older project from a few years ago where uh, we were looking at uh, analysis of genetic variation in human gene regulation. And I guess you, talk, uh, you heard a talk from Thule yesterday on essentially the same topic, so I'll try to go relatively quickly through that. Um, and then more recent work uh, of, over the last year of how to incorporate sort of functional genomics information into genome-wide association studies of, of human phenotypes. And so I'll start uh, with the first. Uh, and we know that uh, genetic variation could potentially affect many levels of gene regulation. If we're interested in how genetic variation influences quote unquote gene regulation, it could do, they could, genetic variants could do a whole number of things. So you could imagine a, a genetic variant that uh, influences transcription initiation through modify, altering chromatin accessibility or transcription factor binding or something along those lines. Uh, you can imagine a genetic variant that influences mRNA processing, so a, a SNP that influences splicing or polyventilation or RNA editing or something. Uh, you can imagine something that influences mRNA degradation through microRNA regulation or non-sense mediated decay. And that's, of course, putting aside everything that has to do with translation. Uh, you could imagine genetic variants that influence all of these things, but those are harder to assay at the moment. And so uh, the experiment I'm going to tell you about uh, is, is based on the, these lymphoblastoid cell lines, which you probably heard about yesterday, which, is, which I think of as sort of a model system for understanding the genetics of, of gene regulation. And so I'm going to be telling you about 75 cell lines derived from uh, white blood cells from uh, Nigerian individuals, these were uh, lymphoblastoid cell lines who so related to B cells. Uh, and at the time, we had 4 million single nucleotide polymorphisms, so these are genetic variants that exist in these, in these 75 cell lines. Uh, and, uh, and we want to look at genomic data, so mRNA expression, DNA methylation, histone marks, uh, et cetera. Right. It's one line from each of 75 individuals. Yeah. And so what, what we're interested in is finding the genetic variants that influence uh, these genomic measurements that we're, that we're looking at. Uh, and in this case, I'm going to be telling you about mRNA expression. Um, and uh, when I say mRNA expression, that's, that's the thing we want to measure. What we're going to be measuring it with is RNA sequencing, which I guess you've heard about. Um, and so what are we, how are we going to do this? This is the sort of the high-level overview. I'm actually going to go into a little bit more detail of uh, the methods here. So this is a, a methods-type course. So first, we're going to isolate polydenylated RNA from this, each cell line and convert it to cDNA. Uh, we're going to fragment and sequence short reads. This was years ago, as you can tell, uh, because of the base pair length of these short reads on the Illumina platform. Uh, count the reads coming from the gene and process them, and then we get uh, an expression level for each gene or exon. Yep. Uh, right. It was just 
that was just to isolate the RNA, and then it was random primers. <coughs> yeah, so there, we, we looked at some point for biases towards one end or the other, and uh, it, if, if there was anything, it was very slight. So the, the random primers do tend to get a pretty good coverage of the, of the gene. And so uh, what can we look at with this type of data? So we have 75 cell lines. We've done RNA sequencing uh, on each of these cell lines. Uh, we can't look at anything regarding protein, obviously. We can look at uh, sort of overall gene expression, which is sort of a balance between transcription initiation and mRNA degradation. And we can look at things relating to our mRNA processing, like splicing and polyadenylation. Um, and so I'll tell you a bit about each of these. Uh, I'll tell you first uh, a bit of work on how to look at trans we look at uh, not transcription initiation, but overall gene expression levels, which are a balance between these two things. Um, and so how are we going to do that? Our first step is, like I said, we isolate the, the polyadenylated RNA. We convert it to cDNA. Uh, and so this is a diagram I'll sort of return to a few times. We have DNA here at the bottom. Uh, in blue are the exons, and then we have the RNA, which is or the polyadenylated fraction of RNA. And this is an example of mRNA where the uh, introns have been spliced out. Um, and then we're going to generate short reads uh, from the cDNA library, and this is, was used in the GA2. I'm um, going to map those, identify the place where each of these reads, short reads came from, and we're going to generate some measure of expression. And so say this is one individual of this gene, we can look at another individual of this gene, they're going to have twice as many RNAs, for example, and we get twice as many reads, right? And so that's the, the basic uh, principle, but it's really it's considerably more complicated than that, is, uh, as you may guess. Uh, the read depth is influenced by a whole host of other things other than just uh, mRNA expression. Uh, uh, one complication is that read depth is influenced by GC content. Uh, and so here what I've done is I've taken this cell line, uh, which was sequenced at Yale, um, and I've split all the exons in the human genome up according to bin of GC content. So take all, I don't know, 100,000 exons, take the, 200, uh, the 1 200th with the, the lowest GC content, and the 1 200th with the high GC, highest GC content, and everything in between, and average the uh, relative expression level of this individual compared to all the other individuals. Uh, and what you can see is that if you take uh, the, the, the lowest GC content bin, uh, this sequencing run really liked uh, low GC content exons and really didn't like high GC content exons. Uh, now you can t take another individual that was sequenced at Argonne, so this was in Chicago, uh, and in this sequencing run, it really didn't like uh, low GC content exons, sort of kind of liked everything in the middle and maybe unclear what was happening at the high end. And so each uh, individual sequencing run had a characteristic profile like this, uh, which if, if naively you were looking for gene expression differences between this individual and that individual, well, you'd find all uh, low GC content things, and that'd be completely artifactual. Yep. <coughs> yeah, so I... Um, so the, it's, it's, it's clearly a technical effect. It's, it's not biological. Um, so one piece of data, which I think is kind of important here, is we then sequence the same sequencing library at different concentrations and can sort of recapitulate patterns like this. So, very, so if you sequence something at one concentration and then a different concentration, you can induce these dependency, these expression differences, quote unquote, Technical, technically caused expression differences based on GC content. And so I actually don't have a, there must be a biochemical sort of explanation for what's happening here. For at some step in the processing of the cDNA and sequencing, there's some step that depends on GC content in a way that is different depending on the concentration of the RNA or the cDNA. Um, yeah, the cDNA. Um, so when you, when you when you put it in for sequencing, you, you can choose to some extent the, uh, the the concentration of the cDNA library. Uh, it, it, yeah. Right. 
question. I don't know. So, so m my sort of uh, take on this is there's probably no way to get rid of an effect like this. So that you could probably, you could probably, if you really studied this effect, you could probably figure out ways to reduce it. Um, but, but it's, I'm going to guess it's never going to go away. That, so actually, these two things we sequenced at the quote unquote same concentration. But of course, anytime you sequence some, something at some concentration, there's some error, uh, and so they're not going to be sequenced at exactly the same concentration. Um, and so it, 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 these sorts of effects, my, yeah, my opinion is they'll never go away. You just have to sort of like be aware of them and try to find them. Um, and so our approach here was to look at this. It looks, you know, there's sort of this curve here, so you can fit this curve. And red is this fitted curve. And so you can take everything uh, in this bin in this individual and just sort of work in a factor and like divide by log two or one to divide by two and say that's the, that's the actual expression level, relative expression level. <coughs> This, yeah, yeah, great point. Yeah, so this is GC content from the reference genome. So, and yeah, most exons actually probably vary at one or two bases at most uh, between individuals. So that's, yeah. yeah. <coughs> so is there, there is no such, like, what does is, what is worse mean, right? So, uh, so, uh, so, yeah, this is actually all relative. So this is, if you look in absolute levels, uh, there's actually a biological effect, which is that higher GC content things are expressed at higher levels. So, uh, and that's a, that's a, I'm pretty sure that's a biological real result in that uh, more gene dense regions uh, with more highly expressed genes or more, uh, have more GC content. But so this is rel this individual relative to the another individual. Uh, so it should take take into account that sort of real biological variation. Um. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. So, which one is, which one is getting you further away from reality? Yeah. So, I, I, it would be good to have like a gold standard. What, what, it, what are, what are we trying to get closest to? And I guess that would be some other technology that doesn't use amplification or something. To or a spike in. Yep. Yep. The, the, that's a good option too. Yep, and so now we're we're estimating these curves for each individual, and since we, you know, we're not particularly interested in these curves, you know, except from a, you know, data processing, data quality point of view, we're just sort of normalizing everyone to be the same, so we're just sort of normalizing that effect out. <coughs> and so that's uh, that's that's one problem. Uh, it turns out there, yeah, go ahead. No. No. Good question. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What 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 is what is during chip generation? What does that mean? Oh. 
I see. That's interesting. I didn't know that. I see. Yeah, there's there's recent things I've seen in genome sequencing as well. Maybe the same sort of thing where people do genome sequencing with quote unquote PCR free libraries, even though there's some PCR steps, um, but it gets rid of a lot of it. Yeah. 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 I don't I don't know what the kit was. <coughs> um, and actually, it turns out GC content. Uh, this is this is an uh, it's just a technical effect, but it's not the most important technical effect. There's a million other things that uh, are different between individuals. So read depth is not just influenced by GC content and gene expression. It's influenced by batch effects, uh, technical variation, uh, like uh, what day of the week these things were run, uh, sex effects, which may or may not be interesting depending on what you're what you're studying, and 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 et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's there's great early literature on on RNA, on DNA microarrays, to cDNA microarrays, um, showing that essentially anything you can think of uh, influences gene ex quote unquote gene expression levels. Uh, the technician that uh, put the put the thing on the microarray, uh, the day of the week, whether it was the morning, whether it was winter or summer, or you know whether you like scratch your left arm or your right arm first, anything, anything influences the measurement, <coughs> and so. What our, our approach here um, uh, was just to be completely agnostic as to what we're trying to, the, these sorts of technical effects we want to remove. And so we, would, we used principal components analysis. Uh, and so if you imagine a 75 individual by 20,000 gene matrix, uh, we just took the principal components of that matrix uh, and regressed, regressed, out, regressed out PCs. And so our final approach here was to count the reads in each exon correct for the GZ content and, of course, the total reads in each lane. Uh, we qu and quantile normalize these expression measurements, remove the effects of principal components, and then do QTL mapping. So we wanted to regress these uh, ex corrected expression levels on uh, the genotypes of all these individuals to identify genetic variants that influence uh, uh, traits. Mm -hmm. They can be, sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, and so, uh, so, yeah, I think the, the f I don't, I don't remember the details, but I think the first one was some sort of batch effect, just because you know we can't do all of them at the same time. So some of them were done one month, and some of them were done a different month, and you know that's the, that's the big thing. Um, and uh, we did two replicates of each sample, and uh, and so you you can correct that sort of batch effect out in, using replicates and, and principal components. Uh, there's also a pretty big uh, sex effect, um, big but relatively big compared to these are 75, the exact same cell type in 75 individuals. So there's not a lot of variation to begin with, but uh, there's also Relative to that relatively little amount of variation, there's also pretty good sex effect. <coughs> and so, what are we looking for? Uh, we're looking for something that looks like this. So, what I'm showing you here on the x axis is position along the genome uh, in megabases along chromosome, I don't remember. Uh, on the y axis is the uh, expression level in reads per million. Um, and that, and this, I've split these panels out. Uh, according to genotype. Uh, in blue are reads that cover annotated exons, and in black are, is the read depth outside of annotated exons uh, on this gene. And this gene goes in this direction, uh, the reverse strand. Um, and so there are 18 individuals in the data that had the GG genotype at this SNP, which is located upstream here. Um, and you can see these nice peaks of gene expression, and this is averaged over these 18 individuals these nice peaks of gene expression uh, on the exons. Uh, and you look at the 16 individuals that had the AA genotype, uh, and it looks like there's essentially no expression at all. Um, I don't remember. Sorry. So in that paper. Um, and then there are 35 individuals that have the GA genotype at this SNP, and they are intermediate. 
Um, and so this is, this is an example of an expression QTL. This is a genetic variant that's associated with uh, gene expression levels in these samples. Um, and we find about 1,000 eQTLs at a false discovery rate of 10%. Uh, it's, it's actually outside. It's over here. Yeah. Right. I, I guess in this, I don't remember the details of this particular SNP, but I guess it's somehow influencing transcription initiation. It's closer to the promoter than anything else. Oh, yeah, sorry. The, the gene goes from here that way. Yeah. Does that, does that mean anything to you? TS All right. <laughs> yeah. I think it's a transcription factor. Is that right? I don't know. Um, so I'm, I'm taking the SNP and looking for what genes it's correlated with. Um, and it's co and I d don't remember how So in this particular analysis, I was taking any SNP within one megabase of the gene. Um, but a SNP could be within one megabase of many genes, of course. Um, and so in this particular case, I don't know if it's near another gene as well, but it's associated with the expression of this gene, for sure. Uh, so I w didn't do any first pass filtering except for genes that were expressed in these individuals. So there's no sort of looking for genes that are, have a lot of variation or anything to begin with. Um, in this case, it was 50% of the individual less than, so if, if there was a gene where 50% of the individuals had absolutely no reads, then I called it not expressed. Um, And so I took all, in this case, 20,000 genes. And in one analysis, I took every SNP in the genome. So I took every, every gene against 4 million SNPs. Uh, but that didn't, you know, most. Yeah, exactly. But almost across the board, the one with the most strongest correlation is really near the gene. So this is a focused analysis of taking every gene and looking at every SNP within one megabase. And so this is one of, just one of the top hits that comes out of that. Yep. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Great question. Um, and so, my my take on that is it's 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 not the frequency per se. It's the frequency relative to the sample size. It's just number of counts that matters. And if, as long as you have a few counts, so, and I have n of 18 here, 35 and 16. As long as that's greater than, you know, three, four, five, then that's fine. So in a huge study, that'll be things at really low frequency. Uh, this was a study of 75 individuals, so I guess anything with, you know, five greater than five percent minor allele frequency or so, we probably had a, a decent chance of getting. Um, so rare things we're not really getting at in this study. Uh, whereas Tui was probably getting at that better. She had a thousand individuals or something. How many individuals were in Thule's study? I think it was around a thousand or something. So they they had they could get at lower frequency things a lot better. Does that not add up to thirty-five, forty-five, fifty-five? <laughs> 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 oh yeah. So 75, uh, th in this particular paper, there were 69. And I hope that adds up to 69, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. 
So yeah, this this is so. So what what I I read I read this as there's probably another transcription start site here. It's. Mm-hmm. Yep. And I, and so my reading of this was that there's an alternative transcription start site here. Uh, and so that's why, it, so black is not annotated uh, transcription. And so I'm, my reading of this was there's an un, unannotated start site here that has lower expression. Um, yeah. And I'll, Yeah, so at this point they're not counts anymore. We've, uh, we've, what have we done? We've uh, counted the read, we have started with counts, we corrected for GC content in the total reads to get a fraction, and then so we quantize and normalize these fractions so that now it's a uh, standard normal. Uh, just convert the fractions to a standard normal and then do normal near regression. <coughs> Uh, just standard linear regression. Mm -hmm. So there, there are things this thing might miss. Uh, uh, if there's a genetic variant with an extremely strong effect, that gives you huge outliers. Um, that this sort of approach would reduce our power to detect that. But in practice, most outliers we see are due to some sort of technical effect. And so one thing you can, one thing we did to sort of test different uh, pipelines here was to say, how many eQTLs do we detect? And say, no matter what we do to the data, unless we do something like really horrible, we're not going to create new eQTLs. Uh, we can only, uh, we, so if, if we find more eQTLs, that means we're doing a better job of finding the true genetic signals. Um, and so if you just take the counts, actually, and try to just run them naively, I th if I remember this correctly, I think we got about 40 eQTLs in the entire genome because the, this stuff is hugely noisy. Uh, there's dramatic uh, technical variation, um, huge outliers. And so if you then do permutation testing to see what things are real and what things aren't, you find essentially no eQTLs. Uh, once you go through all these steps for correcting for all of these things um, and correcting for all your technical artifacts that have been introduced, now you get a thousand eQTLs. So this, there's, there's a lot of value in these sorts of uh, processing steps. Yeah. Yeah. And so a lot of this stuff is, so at least in, in this case, what, everything I was interested in was relative expression across individuals at one gene. Um, and so it's, in, in my head, it sort of made sense to just sort of focus on that and just convert everything to relative expression values and then do association level, uh, association testing on the relative expression level. But I agree that there's, there's probably some information that's being lost in like getting away from the counts. That's the raw data. <laughs> yep, and so. <coughs> yep, and randomly assigning uh, individuals that are zero to things. Yep. Um, and so, actually, most of the eQTL. So, in, in the end, of course, we're interested in eQTLs, and. Um, um, so things that have a lot of zeros are really lowly expressed, and we don't find any eQTLs anyways. And so you, I tried varying that threshold of saying, actually, everyone has to have a count, so I'm getting a real expression level and no, none, none of the zero problem. Um, and it doesn't change much because most of the genes where there are a lot of zeros, we're not detecting any eQTLs because they're at such low, so, such low expression levels. But yeah. <coughs> This example. Kind of like theoretically, I'm not able to try to differentiate how to run that because, so 
relations to the mm -hmm. So like, and I know that I'm sure you're here to like to ask this, but there are a bunch of people here in the room. And like for this example, how many in that end group group? All right, so end group group, like, do you know that all, or is it 100% end group? All 18 have 3G and all have flashy or? So there's, uh, I guess I'm not showing you the variance among these 18, right? Uh, but you can imagine that, so actually, I guess the variance will probably be relatively similar in all of these classes. But so you can imagine that that's the mean at that class, and there's going to be some scatter around there, and there's the mean in another class, and there's some scatter around there, and then there's the mean here, and there's going to be some scatter around there. Uh, but due to the way that I've done the processing, there, I've quantile normalized everything to get rid of outliers and anything like that. And so the the amount of scatter is going to be relatively constant in each of these classes, and and so then you do this linear regression. I actually don't remember what the the p-value is from this, but it's something minuscule. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Right. Is the connection between the you talked about the report? Let's say you have a haploid organism, right? You just G or A. Then essentially mapping it feels like doing a heat test to see if there's anything yep. valued in the dirty part. Yeah. Right? And that's also why it feels that like the count of these ends is just an error of the mean of, say, the G Okay, and so w this is okay. We found a, a thousand ETTLs. That's all. That's all great. Uh, what, what, what we're really interested in doing is what can we what can we do with that? <coughs> can we learn anything about uh, gene regulation? And so, what are like the general properties of ETTLs? In order to do that, we introduce introduce a little bit of extra notation here. Let's divide genes into two classes: those that have no EQTL and those that have one EQTL. And so, what is the probability? that any SNP is an EQTL for some gene, uh, a priori. So what's the prior probability that any SNP is an EQTL for a gene? We're going to model this as pi JK. It's going to have this form. And the form doesn't really matter, except that it's going to depend on some annotations. So uh, the prior probability that the SNP falls uh, is an EQTL can depend on uh, some annotation, and then whether the SNP falls in the annotation. So for example, you might think, uh, Maybe uh, non-synonymous SNPs are more likely to be EQTLs, and you can build this into sort of a, a, a statistical framework for, for testing hypotheses like that. And one thing we were, oh, and so then this is, becomes a likelihood. Uh, here's the effect of the annotation, uh, and then it becomes the, the probability that, that the gene doesn't have an EQTL times the probability that it does have an EQTL and, uh, and, and these priors. So this is the prior that SNPJ is an EQTL, and it depends on these lambdas, which are the annotation effects, and the Bayes factor comparing models where SNPJ is or is not an EQTL. And I'll actually show you a very similar model uh, to this later on with a bit more detail. Um, and so uh, one question we were interested in, uh, in asking is where do EQTLs fall with respect to genes? And so we can divide SNPs into bins based on the distances from the start and ends of genes uh, and estimate this sort of uh, enrichment parameter uh, for each bin. And so if here's the, the five prime end of the gene, there's the three prime end. Uh, imagine a SNP falls here, just upstream. Uh, maybe a, a natural hypothesis is that SNPs in this region might be more likely to be to influence the expression levels of genes. Uh, but what about things uh, in, in the middle of the gene here? What about things in the middle of the gene there? What about things in the middle of the gene there? Uh, it's, it's not obvious to me a priori what you would expect or what happens about, th what, what about things down there. And so you can estimate using the data itself, since you have a thousand EQTLs, you can train a model uh, to estimate what's the probability that a SNP that falls a thousand bases away from a transcription start site influences uh, the expression of a gene. And so we can plug this into to this model, uh, and here's what, what comes out. And so this is a generic gene now, uh, starting from the five prime end to the three prime end, and I've split, uh, split the genome up into bins, ranging from neg uh, 80 kb upstream of the gene to 80 kb downstream of the gene. In blue are, are bins that fall outside of the genic region. 
and black are bins that fall uh, inside of the genic region. Uh, and on the y-axis here is the probability that a SNP in one of these regions influences gene expression of that gene. Uh, and what you can see is a very clear peak right at the beginning of the gene. Uh, and so uh, a SNP that falls right at the start site, of, uh, transcription starter site of the gene, is much more likely to influence the expression level of that gene compared to something 80 kb away. And that sort of uh, makes sense, yeah. Um, so the, the way I've taken the SNP to gene assignment is I've taken a gene and tested every SNP within a megabase for, for, for association. And so, yeah. What do you mean assignment of a SNP to a gene? So I, I would think of it in the other way. That's actually what we're trying to learn. Is it, is it the case that a lot of SNPs fall really far away from the genes that they regulate, for example? Or is there a lot of variation in distant enhancers that uh, is really important for gene regulation? Or is it really things right at the, at the promoter that, that we're interested in? Yeah, sure. It's, so it's, it's every gene, and I'm taking one megabase around every gene. So no, those can be overlapping. So a SNP, I could be testing a SNP for association with this gene, or the its neighbor, or its neighbor, and in principle, it could affect all of them, if, if that was a reality. Anything that it's within a megabase of. They have some frequency distribution, yeah. Uh, so these are specifically chosen to be relatively high frequency. Uh, yeah, so these, this is, this is HapMap. Um, I mean, most of these are going to be somewhere within 5 and 95% frequency. So minor, uh, some variance. So the minor allele frequency will probably be somewhere between 5 and 50% frequency. <coughs> and I'm only looking at SNPs that are vari a variable in these 75 individuals, of course. So So things that don't actually influence their that this is these are SNPs that are not causally related to gene expression. Yeah. They are correlated with gene expression of nearby genes due to some other process. Like or that, you know, so imagine that there's SNPs related to the action of the marker that causes the gene. Yes. So that that, that is that is that is certainly gonna be the case for some of them. Yep. And I think that's what we need to get at, but mm -hmm. how often that is 
Yeah. Because, like, right now, my, my life is just depends on my from two billion tons of knowledge. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so a, a, a fraction of these um, are going to be correlated with nearby SNPs, which in turn actually do something, right? Um, and so the experiment you might want to do is sequence all of these cell lines and find every variant. And so that has, that has since been done. Um, and so now y you have that data in hand. And this, this uh, I mean, this sort of peak, which I'm getting the impression people think it's fairly obvious that things in the transcription start site influence the transcription of genes um, uh, is about the same if you do uh, 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 sequencing of the cell lines. Yep. spread out somewhere. So is there a low level of stuff happening out to exactly. one megabase here, such that the sum here is like 10%, but the remaining 90% is spread out? And that's a, that's a great question. And I think the answer is my next slide. Yes. And, uh, and so uh, long range, so this within 10 KB here, 15 KB, is 90%. So this is 90% of the total probability here. Um, and actually, so there, there, there's the comment that things tend to fall right near the promoter, but that's not totally true because it's all along the entire length of the gene. And so uh, my interpretation of this is that the promoter matters, but actually the actual transcribed region itself uh, is extremely important uh, for the, so anything throughout the entire gene uh, is more likely to influence uh, the expression level of, of the gene. So it's, it's not, it is the promoter, which is extremely important, but also the entire transcript itself. Um, <coughs> yeah, so I don't, I don't have this slide. You can make this just say, take the best p-value and bin it and plot it, and it's really noisy. It's like, I mean, it, it, you, you're, yeah, because there's this stochasticity in what's the best SNP. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Or it's not that you don't have a lot of EPPLs, it's that you have one SNP, imagine you have one SNP that's uh, 80 KB away, but it's in LD with a SNP that's right at the promoter, and they both have the same p-value. Uh, if you're just counting p-values, then you might get that one, you might get that one, but if you're summing across the evidence from all the genes in the genome, you're probably going to upweight the one near the promoter. So significant as in interesting, yes, I would say. Yeah, you, you, you might be, you might, you might really be interested in. Okay, I'm really confident now that this particular SNP is 80 kb away, and it's not in L, it's not correlated with anything near the promoter, and we're really confident that it's doing something at a distance. Uh, that might be more interesting. Yeah, yeah, exactly.
That is, that is a, a great question that I don't know the answer to. I like, would love to answer that question. Like in terms of, uh, oh, so whether they fall in repressors or enhancers on average or something. Yeah, so from, from these data, it's impossible to say, but people later have gone and looked at, uh, so done in these exact same cell lines, done analyses of DNA hypersensitivity um, and some chip seek for different factors, and I think the story, this is, you have to check the paper by Jack Degner at all, and I think the story is that you're right, that most of the SNPs that influence gene expression in these cell lines tend to disrupt the uh, activity of some sort of activator, like some sort of enhancer. But uh, I need to double check that. <coughs> Degner et al., 2012. D-E-G-N-E-R. Degner. Degner. So, uh, so that was uh, all I really wanted to say about overall gene expression levels. Now I want to talk quickly about uh, splicing. So that's the other sort of thing that we can we we were able to look at pretty carefully with the with these data. And so, uh, returning to the sort of schematic for what we're going to do with the data, uh, uh, we have the the RNA here with some short reads. We have the DNA. We map the uh, uh, we map the reads to the, the DNA, and we also look for things that map across uh, the splice junctions. And now imagine we have this individual that has uh, reads that map into, into these exons. So one third of the reads fall into this exon, one third in this exon, one third in this exon, or something. Uh, we look at a different individual that doesn't have that last exon, and now these proportions change. And so what we're gonna do is just treat these uh, proportions uh, like a quantitative trait and, and map them. So in the, we're doing similar sorts of processing of the data uh, instead of looking at overall gene expression levels, what we're going to look at are uh, uh, relative proportions of uh, expression of different exons. And we're going to look for something like this. So uh, this is the same sort of plot along the x-axis, position along the genome. Uh, on the y-axis is uh, the read depth. And again, I've split this out according to uh, uh, alleles of a particular SNP. So here, there are 34 individuals that have the GG genotype of this SNP. And now I'm showing you exactly where this SNP is. It actually falls in three prime splice site of this exon. So these 34 individuals have an intact three prime splice site. Um, uh, these six individuals have a disrupted three prime splice site. And these 29 individuals are heterozygous. And so what you can see uh, is that the individuals with intact three prime splice site expression levels look like you'd expect right on top of the exons. Individuals with the disrupted three prime splice site, um, they have something a bit we more weird going on. We see this new induction of expression uh, upstream, and it's the, uh, an apparent reduction of expression of this exon. And I'll get into sort of what, what looks sort of odd about what's going on here, but in general, this is a SNP that falls in, a, in, a, in the three prime splice site, and it seems to affect the splicing of the gene, as you might expect. Uh, but there's a basic question, is this generally the case? Uh, and the reason you might imagine it is not generally the case is because imagine that SNPs and splice sites are generally deleterious if they're doing this, that if we're looking at 75 random individuals in the population, maybe the things that are at high enough frequency actually uh, don't influence splicing. But, uh, so that's the reason we took a look at this question. But the answer, uh, so we can use the same sort of hierarchical model. We assume there are two classes of genes. Those were there are no SNPs that affect the splicing of the gene, and those were one SNP affects the splicing of exactly one exon. 
And so the reason we build in these model modeling probability, uh, these sort of more restrictive types of uh, assumptions here, is just so we can be more exact on what our parameters are measuring. Um, and we're going to build the same prior probability model, uh, the prior probability that SNP K is in splicing QTL for exon J of gene I is going to have this form. And again, it's going to depend on this annotation effect. So, and then we can label each SNP according to whether or not it's, say, in a, in a, in a splice site and say, and ask whether this annotation effect is different from zero. Do our SNPs that fall in splice sites significantly enriched for splicing QTLs? And as you might guess, the answer is yes. So here is the, that annotation effect. So, <clears throat> and, and a 95% and a conf confidence interval for splice sites. So this is a, a natural log. So there's, what is that, three to the fifth? It's a lot. So it's massive enrichment of SNPs that influence splicing are massively enriched uh, among splice sites. Uh, and this is all relative to those in non-splice site intronic positions. Uh, things within that spliced exon itself also seem to influence, but outside of the splice site also seem to be enriched for SNPs that influence uh, splicing. Things in other exons are essentially equivalent to introns and non-genic SNPs that are sort of a control uh, are massively depleted for SNPs that influence splicing. And so that's uh, the answer to the question I posed there. Uh, uh, and, and so up to this point, I'm showing you here just uh, existing gene annotations. This is ensemble RefSeq as of sometime in 2009. Uh, so what exactly is happening here? Uh, so you can see that in this particular region, uh, when this splice site is disrupted, there appears to be some sort of expression of a new transcript that's not in any annotation database. Um, and so uh, we came up with a, a quick way of just identifying splice junctions from RNA-seq reads. We mapped the short reads to the genome. Uh, and then, so what happens is that the, the reads that span the splice site here actually don't map to the genome because the sequences are not in the genome. Uh, and then we can take the reads that don't map, take 20 bases from each end, uh, and map those instead. And so then we can split up these uh, reads so that half of it maps there and half of it maps there, and then we can infer a splice junction. And so what happens uh, when we do that in this example? If we take all the reads for the individuals with the three prime splice site, it, we find these junction reads. So there's a uh, exon up here, uh, and then we in gray are splice junctions that are annotated in the databases. In red are splice annotations that were not at that time annotated in the databases. We find a new splice junction here that goes from this exon to a new splice site here, uh, creates a new transcript, and uh, this appears to be in frame an in frame a uh, new transcript with about 264 additional amino acids. Uh, and so this disrupt, disrupted splice site, it doesn't get rid of the exon. It creates a new, sp uh, the splicing machinery somehow finds a new splice site uh, considerably upstream and then uh, creates this new transcript uh, with, with uh, several more amino acids. It's, uh, OAS1, uh, I don't know what exactly it does. Right, so the stop codon is somewhere over here. So, and this is in frame, so it should, yeah, so it should be, yeah. Well, I guess it depends on what the gene does, right? And, and in this case, I don't, it's not obvious to me we know what it does. Yeah? Sorry, say that again? I've got the small. This thing? It's, that's what it seems like, yep. Even with the disrupted splice site. It's, um, uh, I don't know the counts here, but it's going to be relatively rare, but it's definitely.
Yeah, and th this is in the canonical two bases, um, but it is it does appear to still be a leaky splice site even even when dis quote unquote disrupted. Yeah, and so this is there, there's an AG here. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's an AG here that was just never it, for some reason it's not used. If there's if there's an a, if there's an intact AG downstream. And so that's actually kind of weird when you think about it because the polymerase is going along here. It hits this AG first. It keeps going. It hits that AG and splices to that AG, unless that one's disrupted, in which case it goes back to the earlier one. So uh, the actual what's actually what's going on here, I don't have a clear idea. But yeah. Yeah, there could be other things happening here that make it extremely disfavored, but if there's nothing there, then, and you give it enough time, then it'll splice there. Yeah. No, not. Yeah, and so there, there's a massive depletion of SNPs in canonical splice sites, actually. If you just plot long, you know, where if you take all the uh, canonical splice sites and, like, the flanking regions and just count SNPs, you see, you know, there's some SNPs, and then right in the two base pairs, it drops off a lot. And so uh, that's all I wanted to say about that, I think. Um, and so that's the first half. So now we'll stop here for a bit. Um, and so genetic polymorphism data uh, combined with genomic data is a powerful tool for understanding human gene regulation. So I think of this as sort of the human equivalent of a, of a mutagenesis screen where evolution has done the mutagenesis for you. Um, and RNA-seq combined with uh, statistical modeling allows for detailed inferences about the locations of polymorphisms that influence structures and splicing. Uh, and I mentioned this briefly. Uh, with this type of data, you can move from quantifying, move to quantifying role of different molecular processes. So uh, transcription factor binding, this is the paper I mentioned before by Jack Degner and colleagues, or mRNA decay by Akma Pai and colleagues. And uh, there's ongoing work in this area. Um, and so I think we should break. And then uh, I have more stuff if uh, you're still interested.